Hugh Padgham, engineer and producer of many of music's greatest names from Paul McCartney, The Police, Phil Collins, Genesis, David Barry, XTC and many more. Hugh's work helped define a golden era of music making using innovative techniques coupled with solid recording practices. This is the story of his rise from redundant tape operator to hit producer to the stars. Hugh began his career as a tape operator at London's AdVision Studios in the mid-70s, but was laid off three months later due to the three-day working week policy, which they had at the time to manage their energy crisis. Although only there for a short length of time, he managed to see enough to convince him that this was the career for him, as he was lucky enough to work on records for artists such as Elton John and Mott the Hoople. After a brief layoff, he managed to get a job at Lansdowne Studios, and it was here that he learned all the key aspects of audio engineering, from mic placement to work in the desk. All the apprentice engineers were encouraged to read books on engineering, such as the sound recording practice by John Berry. A lot of their bread and butter work was doing jingles and albums of cover song compilations that featured the current chart hits. The turnaround for these types of sessions was very quick, so you had to be on your toes. This was a perfect initial education for a young aspiring engineer. And so was working with some of Brock's biggest artists that frequented the studio, usually later on in the day after the less exciting work was completed. Hugh got to work on the Yes album, Drama, this lineup of Yes featured Trevor Horn on vocals, and the two had previously met when Hugh Mix video killed the radio star for his band The Buggles, although Trevor also asked a whole host of engineers to do the same job. So bizarrely, no one actually knows who ended up with the bragging rights to say that they were the one who mixed it. Despite some encounters with the top rock bands, day-to-day -day work was still very much of the middle-of-the-road variety, and Hugh began to get itchy feet. After hearing that Virgin Records were acquiring a new studio in London, he immediately got in touch to offer his services, the townhouse was Virgin's second studio, with the first being the Manor in Oxfordshire. Famous for being the studio where Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells was recorded, the record that kickstarted the whole Virgin label. Opening in 1978, the townhouse studio turned out to be a great place for a young engineer aspiring to work with the day's top acts. Not long after joining, he was working on XTC's Drums and Wires with Steve Lillywhite as producer. Hugh and Steve formed a great working relationship and continued to work together with other artists including Peter Gabriel and his third solo record. On drums for the recording was a pre-solo career, Phil Collins from Genesis. And on the first day, three fortuitous things happened that added a whole new dimension to drum recording forever. The first was a bizarre one. For some reason, Peter entered the studio that day to proclaim that he didn't want to have any cymbals on the record, for no reason other than the idea just popped into his head. The second was that as Phil was warming up on a cymbalist kit, he was playing through the nice new SSL mixing desk that on each channel had a compressor, EQ, and importantly, a gate. The third was that for some reason the talkback mic was engaged, which meant the built-in compressor for the talkback mic was also working. This compressor was designed to bring up speech in the live room, so it had a very aggressive setting. When Phil played the drums with its compressor engaged, the sound was huge, but the gates that were engaged also cut off the long sustain that the compressors would have accentuated. If there were cymbals being played, then this would have sounded cacophonous and immediately dismissed. Instead, it sounded incredible to the ears of those who heard it. Peter decided Phil should play a groove using this setup, and he would write a song around it. This song became Intruder, and was the first song to include the now famous gated reverb drum sound. It's worth noting that Steve Lillywhite does claim to have worked on something similar previously, with bands like the Psychedelic Furs and Susie and the Banshees, but this version is by far the most famous. The Stone Room at Townhouse also became famous because of this natural reverb sound that some people confuse with artificial reverb. In fact, you can get a plug-in today that tries to emulate this unique sound using a room that was built as a replica of the original townhouse studio. The following year, Phil Collins, who was unsure of his Genesis future, decided to branch out with a solo album of his own and invited Hugh to help produce it. Phil had been working in his home studio on what would become his debut album Face Value, with his 8-track 1-inch Brennell machine, Prophet 5 synthesizer, Roland CR78 drum machine and a mic. He recorded the sparse but engaging song In the Air Tonight. Hugh recognised its potential straight away and set about recreating his demo in the studio proper, although he never quite got the same atmosphere as the demo. So at this point, he took the brave decision to record Phil's demo onto the studio tape as it was, and then record overdubs onto that. So this meant another generation of tape degradation had been added. But it was felt that the vibe was so much more important than fidelity. 
At this point, the most famous aspect of the song was conceived. The drum fill that introduces the end chorus section. Remembering the drum sound they achieved on Peter Gabriel's album, they set about creating a deliberate impact to shock the listener. With careful mixing by riding faders, Hugh maximised the surprise and created one of the most iconic moments in pop. Hugh's production style was definitely beginning to form by this stage, and his less is more philosophy allowed more clarity in the recording, with the instruments having their place in the mix without the unnecessary clutter of extra parts. Having performed plenty of mixes by this stage, Hugh would have been well aware of the advantage that fewer elements had when drawing attention to the important parts that were the crux of the song. After a recommendation from XTC, who were touring with the police, Sting approached Hugh to produce their album, Ghost in the Machine. The album was to be recorded at Air Studios in Montserrat, the exotic volcanic island in the Bahamas. The studio was essentially a large villa with the band divided into separate rooms to lay down the basic tracks. However, Hugh, dissatisfied with the lacklustre sound in the actual recording space, made the decision to move the drums to the dining room where he thought the acoustics were better suited. Sting preferred to record alongside the producer in the control room, as he used a DI for his bass. Hugh even doubted if Sting owned a bass amp, as he never brought one to the studio. Sting did and probably still does have a strong commitment to fitness, and even brought a jogging trampoline into the control room that he would bounce on while laying down his bass lines. Despite the police being known for their energetic live performance and Sting's musical expertise, the act of bouncing up and down in the control room gave rise to quite a few issues for the recording process, including the risk of expensive equipment shifting around the room. Not only this, Sting's actual ability to play the bass was compromised, and a lot of takes weren't quite up to scratch. In fact, it was so bad on the track Demolition Man that Sting's guitar tech Danny had to redo the entire bass part after Sting had left for the day. The recording was a success though, and the album went on to bolster the police's position as one of the world's top bands and spawned the big hit Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic. With this success, it was in demand working again with XTC for their album English Settlement. Tired from their mammoth touring schedule, XTC were given the time and space to create a double album full of great songs and ever increasing studio prowess. The album highlighted Hugh's technical skills as a producer, letting the artist be creatively fulfilled. His talent was not pigeonholing the artist or forcing ideas upon them to make the album he had in mind. Next up, he was back with Phil Collins for his follow-up solo album, Hello, I Must Be Going. Phil also convinced Genesis that it was the man to produce their next album, Abacab, helping to give them a more contemporary, accessible sound. In 83, the police came calling again, and again they jetted off back to Montserrat with a clear sonic vision for the album. We sat down and said, we're not going to use any effects apart from a bit of subtle tape echo, maybe a little harmonizer, but no out and out flange and all that sort of thing. Any effects that we do have on guitar, Andy Summers would get them at point source out in the studio. I suppose if I have a favorite effect and it's tape echo, you can do so much with it. You can make things sound like they're coming from a long, long way away by using repeating effects and giving things a lot of depth. There'd always been tension in the band, in particular between Stuart Copeland and Sting, but the situation had reached the next level of disharmony when recording got underway and the pair couldn't even be in the same room together. When recording moved to Canada, he recalls the fractious attempt at recording one of the police's biggest songs, Every Breath You Take. Sting would go skiing in the morning. Stuart would come in and say, right, I want to overdub a hi-hat on that song. Sting would come in in the afternoon, sing something, and Stuart would go off skiing. We'd have a conversation like this. So what did you do in the morning? And I'd play in the recording. Get rid of it, he'd say. But don't you think we should discuss it with Stuart? And he'd stand by the machine and say, right, put it into record. I want to see you hit the record button now. Then Stuart would come in the next day and say, where's my f***ing hi-hat gone? This proved to be the police's last album due to these conflicts. And Hugh really had his work cut out with one of the most important skills of a producer, diplomacy. Producing hit records is how you get on with a client and how you manage egos, he says. Amid the excess and arrogance of the 80s, some of our greatest pop stars created their finest sounds. So understandably, relationship management played a part in keeping a handle on recording and studio shenanigans. There are countless diplomatic aspects to producing. I always maintain a cheery disposition and try to be easy to get on with. That really helps. But you need to balance it with being great at your gig too and make the most of the opportunities when they come. Hugh was now the man to employ and David Bowie came calling next to get some of that Hugh Pageum sound. Although Bowie had just come off the back of the huge Let's Dance album for what would become Tonight, he just didn't quite have the songs. Certainly not Bowie's finest hour. However, he and Hugh got on very well and remained friends, 
Even though Bowie slagged off the album quite heavily later, branding it my Phil Collins years. Despite this, Paul McCartney was a fan of the sound and wanted a bit of that Phil Collins magic for his next album that would become Press to Play. Unfortunately, working with Paul was not quite as he'd imagined it. He received McCartney's demos with anticipation, but his excitement waned as he listened to the songs. Hugh described the experience as if he had to improve something inherently flawed, and the recording process faced significant challenges. There was also uncertainty about the album's producer, with questions arising about whether it was Hugh or former 10CC member Eric Stewart. Eric would show up on a daily basis and observe from the back of the control room, while the recording sessions progressed slowly and with great effort. A really good quote from this session was when Hugh suggested shortening the middle eight of one of the songs when Paul replied, "Uh, How many hit songs have you written, Hugh? His work with Phil Collins and Genesis continued into the 80s and 90s to great success, and the album Invisible Touch by Genesis sold 13 million copies worldwide. The albums No Jacket Required and But Seriously were huge hits also. Despite the breakup of the police, he did continue to work with Sting and most impressively on 10 Summoners Tales released in 1993. The album went on to earn a Grammy for Best Record that year and spurned big hits like Fields of Gold. Hugh is still active today, mainly producing his passion which are jazz records. He did still lend his hand to the pop world though in the 2000s with acts like McFly to big commercial success. Hugh's career spanned a who's who of talent, especially during the 80s, and there are many more bands he worked with that I haven't even mentioned in this video, such as Split Ends, Hall & Oates, The Human League, and much more. Meaning his influence on the evolution of record making can be heard everywhere. All you probably need to do is just switch on the radio.